Lovely. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Caroline. I'm now head of audience engagement with MOLA, um, but also project manage Citizen Coastal Interstellar Zone Archaeological Network, along with my colleagues Gustav Milne and now uh, newly appointed uh, Hannah Morrell, and uh, with a team of um, nine other archaeologists, we look at the. Um, that the combining or how we combine and look at archaeology both as uh, as just just something very interesting that we're all very very keen on but also the the combination of that with climate change and climate resilience of course we can't do this alone and um, we always work with funders and uh, project supporters here are just a few of them to um, at the moment that are extremely important in what we do and and give energy to what we can do and how we can get out there. So the um, sponsors are vitally important, but so is the rest of the Citizen team who are spread all over the UK and go out to sites all the time, constantly trying to find good things that the tide had brought to us because the tide is our excavator and then we are the surveyor. So for Citizen, we really look at um, Citizen's adaptive response to coastal changes. Um, we are, or we want to, we're, we're looking at the, as the, the, the longest archaeological uh, citizen science project because we go all around the English coastline. Um, and we can't do this alone. Like I said, as, as our tide is our excavator, we can't actually choose uh, where stuff is going to come out of the sea, where stuff is going to come out of the cliffs and where it's going to be good and where it's going to look good. So we need help and we need help from the public to do this. So first of all, we have public engagement engagement and that raises our profile helps our message to get out there. We also need desperately need public participation to get the job done. We can't get out and survey all the sites that the tide presents to us in, in quick enough time before the next tide can come along and take our, our artifacts, our subjects away. So we need that public participation. Also, we need cross-sector partnership for our sustainability. This isn't just a little project that we're, we're gonna be interested in. It's a little, little thing that we, we wanna do and then it will go away. No, we want to stay in order to stay we have to have these cross partner partnerships, uh, cross, sorry, cross sector partnerships for our future. Now, for those of you who don't know Citizen, a little whistle stop tour of our first of our Citizen Science. Our, our Citizen Science and Dissemination is that is the most public part of our project. So we go out with volunteers, we go out with groups, and um, the general public can actually just join in and, and watch what we're doing. So over here we have we have walks, we have tours, we have training events, um, and those can be for, for hulks and wrecks, they can be for lime kilns, as you can see in the bottom right there fish traps i don't know if you could make it out but it's on the top right um walking tours and also just um uh, general uh, general tutorials on how to use our app and how to use all our products. We also need to get it out generally to the public through um through just uh, social media feeds through our our YouTube channel and also um, through t television. Of course, for, for all of these, we are actually running against uh, fashions and trends and what these, the general public are doing um, outside of archaeology. So when we're trying to get system sciences in, it's very difficult, especially I think in the next few weeks when lockdown hopefully releases everyone, everyone wants to go to the pub, the last thing they want to do is come and see our, our, our webinar series. So we've got to watch out and what, what the public trends are and what the public are up to. With Britain at low tide, it was all very good we're on channel four but we are up against strictly come dancing so for sister and science to work we've got to be aware of a wider picture of what's going on around us and not just actually what we want to do and how we want people to interact with us then over to the cross uh, part cross sector partnerships again we can't do what we do alone and we should never do it alone we should be sharing and we should be working with others here we did um, for example on the left there uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation a partnership digital exhibition um, looking at our sites but also the records that we use with our um, armchair archaeology uh, volunteers to help research and look further into what we have and the sites we have and what's left over from our sites but also so, um, for example, this podcast for Festival of Archaeology on the uh, climate change debate and archaeology. Again, very vital to get the message out, but also share all our information and everything we collect. And then we also have to obviously 
have that adaptation and we've never had to adapt more than we've had to adapt over the past year so our guided walks turned to self-guided walks our self-guided low tide trails turned into virtual low tide twitter trails our volunteer training turned into armchair archaeologists our conferences turned into twitter conferences and webinars our, our kids events turned into crafting with citizen each time we've had to work we've never stopped we have to just adapt and change because the message is still constant and we've still got to get our message out there Alongside this, and really our, um, our main project product is our Citizen app. This is where people can, you can walk along a beach, see something, wonder what it is, check out it on the Citizen app and find out, you know, if, if there is something there. If there's nothing recorded, then that's, that's the opportunity for that member of the public. They don't have to be a signed up volunteer as such. They can be a Citizen scientist and record that for us. Or somebody who's a, a doggy walker who, who walks along a piece of uh, coastal path regularly and sees a difference or sees a change. They can record that change for us and it comes straight to the moderation, moderation team. So this is in, in a nutshell what Citizen is doing. We're recording, we're looking, we're finding whatever the tide excavates for us. And this comes with a lovely, uh, you know, work makes good prizes and we are award winning. So here, Gustav Mill, my predecessor, Steph Ostrich, uh, receiving their British Archaeological Awards for Best Community Engagement Projects for 2018. And also the Charity Awards for 2018, the Arts, Culture and Heritage category for mapping Britain's coastal heritage. So we do all right, we do quite well. But what is our, our biggest problem and the hardest thing to tackle is where archaeology and climate change meet. And where do they meet in the bigger picture beyond Citizen? We are all preaching to the converted with our own team. But how do we get the message out further? Now, as a small very bored lockdown exercise in the depths of winter. I actually went through all my copies of British Archaeology magazine from 2004 to 2018. And I cut out every single article that was related to climate change and archaeology. And in all those publications, uh, there, there are other, other archaeological magazines available, but for British Archaeology magazine, this is it. This is all there is. I hope you can see that there's about five millimeters worth of articles related to specifically climate change and archaeology. In a similar subject, well, in a similar vein, I actually took the same copies and then pulled out everything on Stonehenge. Every single article is related to Stonehenge and we have pages upon pages on pages, pages, pages of Stonehenge, let alone all the specials for every single time Stonehenge meets some new discoveries, some new things that are going on. So this shows a quite disproportionate amount of attention that is given to one subject, but compared to this one, which is most important subject, which is on everyone's agenda at the moment, but it doesn't seem to still quite reach the archeological agenda. Now, generally, if we look wider, we look at the wider issues of climate change and the climate crisis, you can see here climate change projections. So the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is the United Nations body for assessing science related to climate change. And as you can see here, their projections are warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers, etc. This is, this does have an effect. This does change how we look at the coasts because it's not just about a tide or a rising sea level. When you have a, a hot, dry summer, that means the earth cracks. And during a warmer, wetter winter, more water can get in and permeate these cracks, which therefore creates bigger uh, coastal erosions along our coastal crust. If you look further down, you have the Climate Change Committee, which is an independent a statutory body advising the UK government on the Climate Change Act of 2008. And as you can see there, they're also noticing flooding, drought, wildfire erosion. These are big, big changes. And all these changes in climate are a core issue with heritage issues. But when you look on Google, put on the climate change crisis, you've got to scroll past a lot of skinny polar bears and a lot of um, images of dramatic climate events before you can get anywhere close to um, climate change as a heritage problem. It's always seen as an extreme event. And actually climate change isn't an extreme event always. It's in quite many situations, it's gradual. So you can see this gradual change here with these uh, 
with these temperature stripes, it changes over time. It changes over hundreds of years. The Met Office also have a, um, a state of climate change report they put out. And you can see from here that all these small changes, 1% here, 2% there, it's all very important, but it still doesn't resonate really with archeology. span Boris Johnson has put out his 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. This is very much on the agenda. This is very much in the public sphere. This is what the public are thinking about. This is what they get bombarded with. Now, actual activities, uh, we do have, the, for example, the Climate Change Act with our, our net zero by 2015 targets. We have the Department of Business and Energy and, sorry, Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. They are the lead for climate change mitigation. There's DEFRA, the government lead for climate change risk adaptation. There's the Cabinet Office who are looking at COP26 or managing COP26 and the Climate Change Committee, which I mentioned before. And there are also key reports coming out about uh, climate change risk assessment. Um, uh, the, there's the five-year strategy on how we all meet women, peace and security commitments under the United Nations and our climate change prediction tools that were um, a report released back in 2018 on how we can help decision makers assess their exposure to climate and climate risk. Those are the UK activities, there's also international activities with the 2013 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement, which I'm sure we've all heard of, the Panel for Climate Change Reporting, COP, and also most interestingly and quite recently, the Climate Change Network, which is a volunteer mutual support network for arts, culture and heritage organisations committed to adding their community aiding their community, sorry, in climate change and achieving the ambitious um, ambitions of the Paris Agreement. So there's lots going on, but how can we relate it back to archaeology? Now, normally with climate change and coastal change, you see dramatic cliff falls. These are all very well, but they don't really affect us generally day to day. Apart from the person that uses that particular coastal path, it's a very dramatic, cool looking picture, but it doesn't really affect us. It doesn't do that much. However, if we change it now and put a, a dwelling there, this is down at Hall Sands in South Devon. Uh, the picture on the left was actually taken in 2015 by my predecessor at Citizen, Lauren. If you look at the one on the right, that's taken by myself in 2019. And just in this small space of time, you can see the, um, the garden shed has gone there on the cliff. Um, but this is actually, this is an abandoned village. This is a, a site that's already gone. However, if we turn this picture around and look at the rest of the, the dwellings up the cliff, it's not really about what's happened in the past, but what could happen in the future. And nothing actually makes a person, um, makes a human being actually move is when there is a threat to their property or life. As you can see here at Sidmouth, the clifftop houses are losing over three feet of garden per year. Now climate change is really on the agenda for everybody's um, homes, their threats to their lives, their threats to their dwellings, their threats to their property. And we want to get to a situation where, where they're already moving, they've already made changes, they're already adapting before we it all crashes and Citizen gets in there and starts surveying. Now, to infuse a local public between climate change here and archaeology, there are some projects we have been doing. Now, this one in particular, which is just finished, um, funded by the Natural Environments Research Council. So the Citizen team are based down at Mersey Island in Essex. Um, note that for the work that they've been doing over the past few years, they've found that coastal communities are first-hand witnesses to the scale, speed and impacts of coastal change. Each member of a community has a, is a living archive of life by the sea. They're witnessing a subtle daily, weekly, yearly changes from a very unique perspective. And lives are played out... Um, and memories formed on these beaches and on these coastal paths. Two areas were chosen on Mersey Island to start this study of how we can look at surveying and um, recording archeology, span but in a more public friendly way. And do we get anything different out of it? So rather than just doing the core samples and um, getting our RTK out, et cetera, instead we asked the public and did a call out for postcards, images, an oral archive. And on the basis of those, the team of Daniel Newman, 
Oliver Hutchinson and Lawrence Northall started to form information on particular sites and they put this information on maps and looked at the progression of a coastal change and a coastal use and a sense of place onto these maps. And they have come up now with set of 20 year periods over 100 years and on how these places have changed and how they have affected this island community and this feeling of place. So what could we measure out of that? Well, really it was, it was the rates of change in these 20, 20 year intervals. The estimate in salt marsh and sediment loss, the emergence of archeological features, the rates of decline and the moments of significant loss. All of these are very unique indicators that wouldn't have um, formed, we wouldn't have had it such a good picture if it wasn't for that community engagement. But now through this, we have also empowered that community. This community can now talk about coastal change on an island life and an island community. They are empowered to talk more about climate change through the archaeological record that is actually lies within them. Now, this is all very well, but it's actually, it's still very modern. And for, for most of us at this conference of these two days, we are talking about prehistory and deep history. And how can prehistory reinvigorate or reinvigorate modern climate change resilience in the climate change debate? Now, I think prehistory and a, a drowned landscape can certainly do the same as what we do on a, a drowning landscape, an intertidal landscape. So you can mourn loss. You can teach the public how to mourn loss and say, okay, let it go. We can also um, show a sense of place because people lived here when they did stuff. So sense of place is very, very similar in terms of the message that a, a drowned landscape can get across. But also what we have with a prehistoric landscape is a long human view of life. If you've ever looked at climate change indicators for the future, it's usually only about 100 years. And it's based on something that's been happening over the past 100 years. It's a very, very small time period. Now, what's a... Um, a drowned landscape, a deep history, a prehistoric landscape can do is give the long view of human life. And the long view of human life enables to indicate things like tipping points. There have been climate tipping points and climate crisis and global warming, global cooling over many, many thousands of years. Tipping points are really important at the moment. The future tipping point is still undecided. There are clues and answers within past tipping points that could help future tipping points. There's also a because of the work that is being done in prehistory and deep prehistory, we can see that actually this kind of climate change now is rapid and it's different. It's actually very different to past climate changes. And because of that, we can demonstrate that this is new and this current climate change isn't not just general climate change, it is a climate change crisis. It's a real justification to demonstrate crisis because we've never experienced this kind of rapid change before. But more importantly, human long views or sorry that long views of the past can demonstrate survival of the adaptable and a spirit of the adaptable that we can't do with modern climate change or something when we look past 100 years climate change tends to be and when we work with archaeology it tends to be something that has destroyed died been tumbled down a cliff and it's it's very negative it's very doom and gloom however this long human view really demonstrates the survival of the adaptable. But in a drowned landscape, as Gary's already said, it's extremely difficult to get that point across. How do you give uh, a, uh, a indication of the spirit of the survival of the adaptable and the fact that we, we can move on and there is something really, really good and significant in looking at past or deep history without being able to get to it? Now, one of the important things is it doesn't matter how small your artifacts are. We need something that the public can kick. If they can kick it, then they get it. Then they get a thing that they get that something's there. And I, I noticed yesterday some people were apologizing for their um their pollen charts. It's like you never apologize for the pollen charts because the pollen is something brilliant. It's something you can kick. It doesn't matter how small it is. It is there and the public can understand, general public can absolutely understand that. With this, I've just used um, some very bubbly, lovely, cuddly, plantomic foraminifera 
tiny things, but great for the public. They're interesting. They are intriguing. They can give a landscape. They can describe a landscape. They can do a lot. And all you need to do is just work out, do we blow it up? Do you make it 3D? I remember with uh, Maritime Archaeology Trust, we turned these in with a pair of 3D glasses into 3D posters. So they really pop out. Gareth and I um, also had this idea. I think Gareth and I had this idea of we're going to make them into sculptures a bit like the ones that were going around cities about 15 years ago. There were sculptures of, I think, rhinoceroses in Southampton and I think I think it was lions in Bournemouth and so on. We did actually ask the council, could we put four aminifera, massive ones, all around Southampton? Never went forward with the project, but I think I really should have because it would have been a fabulous way to really get Bolden a cliff um, in people's minds and the tiniest things and showing that the tiniest things can make a beautiful landscape. Um, and help and help us sort of translate it for, for general public for general public consumption. So can you kick it? It's got to be something you can kick. You've got to have artifacts that they can kick. And then secondly, can it be counted? Once it can be counted, people can say and people can understand the scale of your landscape, the scale of what you're looking at. If you can kick it and you can count it, if you've got a site, you can kick and count, then you have a citizen science project. Now, I've taken this concept from Alistair McIntosh, who wrote Hell on High Water, Climate Change, Hope and the Human Condition. And basically it says that if you can't give something to something to someone to count or kick, then it's really difficult to get across a scientific concept. But once you've got that counting, kicking ability, then not only do you have the public on board, but you will have a bunch of willing, happy citizen science volunteers who will help you gather the greater data, the larger data that you need to get for your work and for your science work to continue. So really for drowned landscapes can contribute to modern climate science and future prediction models, but it also evokes the spirit of flora and fauna adaptive adaptability. Uh, drowned landscapes can give a message of hope and when you have something you can kick and count drowned, la drowned landscapes can empower citizen scientists and reinvigorate that climate change resilience thank you very much thank you very much caroline i love the idea of the um the positive the positive ending there and the positive raised upbeat ending to thinking about coastal change and erosion um does anybody have any questions uh, just a reminder to put them into the chat yes we have one that's come through uh from Bjorn Nilsson uh from Lund if we would like to deploy a similar project in Sweden are some of your apps open source so our app, um, first of all, you, you are very welcome to come and have a play with it and download it and use it. It is currently restricted to the Citizen Project and the funding that we're in for, for just the, the English coastline. But we're certainly happy to share as much as we can with you. And if we can get Citizen running internationally, that would be phenomenal. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Oh, we have another question uh, from Rachel, maybe it's a comment. Uh, she says, I can testify to the success of your public engagement through Thames Discovery Programme. A few years ago, I attended an event, uh, then volunteered and have now been trained to run public foreshore events here in West London. Uh, TDP is the, oh, it's shifted, <laughs> is the only maritime landscape opportunity for public engagement in this area. Can you come com on? Mm -hmm. Can you comment on its future? As I understand, it is under threat. So um, about three weeks ago, um, I changed roles to become head of audience engagement and um, TDP will be coming under my wing. And it's like with any project, once the funding has come to an end, we've got to apply for more. Um, TDP, we have applied for more uh, funding from the, I think it's, it's a Heritage Lottery Fund funding this time to do more work. Um, if the money comes through, I don't want to jinx it, but if the money comes through and it all, it all comes out, turns out well, then absolutely it's not under threat. Um, at the moment, we're just waiting. But I certainly wouldn't want to close that project. This is the project has a most amazing legacy, and it's the reason for Citizen in the first place. Citizen um, wouldn't be here without Scape and TDP projects. So, in that 
on that note, I have no uh, intention of losing Thames Discovery Programme and we will be actively, actively always sourcing more funding to keep it going. Thank you. Well, fingers crossed. It's so important. And I think that, you know, it's clear today from this session as, as much as anything, the, the importance of community archaeology in submerged uh, paleo landscapes, submerged archaeology, coastal archaeology. It's just really an important strand for, um, for, for surveying, for monitoring, and for understanding those oral traditions and oral histories, whether you're talking about the deep time or whether you're looking at more recent, like your postcard project. So yeah, <laughs> and certainly deep prehistory has an has an absolute place at the climate change, modern climate change debate table. <laughs>